was the sort of blase liberal, you know. Uh, there was sort of this, there were these different ways in which people found their, ra their racial animus. And I think Howard Mosher put this forward, I thought, in pretty interesting ways. Um, one of the things we're hoping to do also, in, because we'll do our 100 town tour, our big tour of Vermont with the film, is to also bring Stranger in the Kingdom back and, and try to have it be a resource that can be used. Uh, it hasn't been digitized yet, but it, it, it will be. Um, and so part of the idea is to, is to just have some conversation. You know, about, I mean, Ethan Allen will not be trashed, but he will be demystified, I believe, in this film. He is a larger-than-life character. I sort of see him as a Gerard Depardieu you know, type of, you know, when I talk about runaway truck of a man. So he's big and, and, and brash and articulate, and he, he, he is smart and very much about his own legacy. He was really full-time focused on making sure that he would be the guy. And to the extent that Ira Allen, after he died, made deals with historians that he would give them inside information only if they advance the Ethan Allen legacy as Ira Allen articulated it. And there were, you know, and there are falsehoods in this. And, and Ethan Allen's own narrative, which he was spinning constantly, oh, yeah. was exaggerated. You know, constantly. He was saying stuff that didn't happen, omitting stuff that did happen. The whole Ethan Allen narrative of the capture of Fort Ticonderoga does not even mention the name Benedict Arnold, who was the co-leader of the expedition. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that would be bad for press. <laughs> Ira spun, because of course Ethan got imprisoned for two and a half years, you probably know this, on a prison ship, a British prison ship. Trying to invade Montreal. Montreal, yeah. with 38 guys, <laughs> under order specifically not to do it. And then Ira, pins the blame on Seth Warner, who is actually an authentic hero of the Green Mountain Boys, who did lead the Battle of Bennington, you know. And so suddenly, Seth Warner is suddenly implicated on, because he didn't show up. Well, he was never supposed to show up. Anyway, it's nuts. That's going to be part of the story, too? Uh, the battle of the, the, the attack on Montreal is part of the story. Yeah, it's wow. a big story. Uh, I was going to say, it's, wait, it's a big story. Seven hours? <laughs> and, and there will be also, we will, we, are, we will restage about 15 different vignettes from the Battle of Bennington. Wow. I have a clarifying question. Yeah. So, I heard you say early on that there's myths that we didn't brutalize Native Americans in order to inhabit Vermont. Like, oh, we're the first ones here. Which I think is a great myth, thing to demystify demythify and to reveal we are guilty of that but then more recently i think i heard you say like the film will reveal that we've always been more racially diverse in vermont than people think which kind of sounds like the opposite message of like we're really good on racial history and so i'm yeah. curious did i misunderstand sure. you about no, the no, first no. objective there were we people of color here that is the demystification that we want to take and that place. we caused harm to those Yes, we, well, we will see the, the, the scenes dealing with indigenous people, can, there, there are several. Mm -hmm. there, there is, remember Baker gets shot trying to evict a Yorker sheriff from his home in north, uh, around um, uh, Lake Champlain. He, in order to, and he gets, he gets wounded in his leg and they, he seeks medical attention from an Abenaki healer. And so there's a scene that happens there in a sort of Abenaki dwelling uh, with some other women, and it's, it's, a, it's a female healer. Um, but the idea I think you're saying is, you know, that, that what we want to talk about is that the fact that there actually was diversity. There was and we racial never diversity here. It. But will the brutalization of. Um, <clears throat> You know, how we yeah. disenfranchise well, people. Certainly, certainly how, certainly how the, the princes are dealt with. The princes are terrorized. Their, their barn gets burned out. And they were. Yeah. They were terrorized. That's Lucy. That's Lucy yeah. and her but family. But in terms of the First Nations In, in terms of the indigenous people, um, the only document, I mean, I, there's more research that's still happening. We have documentation that Ira Allen used force to evict Abenakis from land that he was claiming near uh, Swanton. That is documented. Uh, and so that will be seen. But we also see 
scenes with Mohawks where Ethan, where the Ethan, Mohawk kills Ethan Allen's messenger. we see the Mohawks kill Ethan, Ethan, <coughs> Ethan Allen's cousin, remember Baker, and we also see uh, afterwards Ethan trying to make a deal with the Mohawks over some of this land by meeting with a Mohawk chief. And the Mohawks mess up the deal. And the Mohawks basically laugh at the deal. Because I mean, you know, yeah, the Mohawks. How much land did the Mohawks end up with in Vermont? <laughs> yeah, the know. Mohawks never had, the Mohawks the never had a huge claim yeah. in Vermont, but they did have some land that they claimed uh, east of the of the Lake Champlain, sort of between Middlebury and uh, Shelburne, hmm. as far as I can tell. But not a lot, because that was considered Abenaki land, and the Abenakis and the Mohawks were at each other's throats periodically. And the the Mohawks fought for the British, and the Abenakis fought for the French in the French and Indian War. And the Mohawks fought for the British in the American Revolution also, partly because the British were promising not to, have to, to carry out any further westward expansion. And they knew the Americans were going to conduct westward expansion. I'm sure the British would have too if they had won. Will you motivate the Mohawks killing of Ethan Allen's um, uh, messenger? It happens. It, it, it is motivated in the narrative. The Abenakis tell, remember, Baker that his proposal is not going to go down well with the Mohawks. Yet he persists, and he comes up with, with a couple of his guys in, in their canoes, and they do some scouting, and they come back to their canoes, and remember, is, is look, surveying Lake Champlain, and he says, have you ever seen any place like this? And one of the guys with him, who is Peg Sunderland, who is one of the Green Mountain Boys, says, uh, Mohawk. And remember, says, go get the votes. I'll be there. And no, he says, I'll get the votes. You go to the point. And remember, goes down to get the votes, and the votes aren't there. Two canoes. And, he, and, the, and the Mohawks close in on him. And he says, I have a proposal. And then he says, let me be. And the gun goes off. And so it's not a brutal, you know, we're not doing a whole gratuitous thing, and, and uh, but that's basically what happened. So, so anyway, so this is the idea, and then of course we make the film through our semester cinema program. We have students who will be a big part of it. We're shooting half of it in Nantucket, half of it in Vermont. Um, why are we shooting in Nantucket? Well, because the state of Massachusetts will give us two hundred thousand dollars if we do that. In tax incentives. And also, we have $100,000 that we've raised on Nantucket. Uh, so Nantucket will become colonial Philadelphia. Huh. And Nantucket will also become sets. We will build probably six or seven sets that will include interiors of the, of the Prince home in Vermont. And then we will shoot also half the film in Vermont. Uh, the, the, the temptation would be to shoot all of it in Massachusetts because we would get another 100000 if we did. But we want to shoot it in Vermont. What's the budget? Uh, the budget is one point five million dollars. Um, Very efficient of you. Impressive. Which is um, less than we spent really on. That's really smaller than previous Jay Craven films. Well, it's smaller yeah. than the Mosher films, uh, right. for sure. Yeah, the Mosher films were two million dollars basically each, and so thirty years later, to make a movie for less money is, is a huge squeeze. Wow. Really? Yeah. But in the world of what is constitutes independent filmmaking today, I mean, you, we, we all know. I mean, you don't make money on films, okay? I don't know and anything. That about that it, story is worse idea. than ever, uh, and we can talk about it. But um, you know, it started to shift at the time we made Stranger in the Kingdom, where the rivers flow north, returned, you know, a fair. I mean. Basically, where the rivers flow north is make, made on a budget of two million dollars. It returned about one point five million dollars. Foreign sales company went bankrupt, owing us five or six hundred thousand um, dollars. But Stranger in the Kingdom hit hit a wall with the the movie industry starting to change dramatically. Where one night Blockbuster said. Because there were there was a, an era where video VHS tapes cost sixty bucks a piece, out to forty thousand video stores in America, mm. and where the rivers flow north sold forty thousand videos at thirty at sixty bucks a piece. Some were discounted, some were this, some were that. So that was real money. 
in, in 1996, which is when we made Stranger, Blockbuster said, we're no longer going to pay $60 a piece for a video. Mm -hmm. We're going to pay $5 a piece. Ooh. And okay. so it decimated that model. I'm of, trying to calculate the revenue. Is that, um, is 60 times 40, is it 2.4 million or is it so 60 times 40 is 2.4 million. Yeah, so that would be your. So if you did 40,000 at $5 a piece, which we didn't do, it would be, you know, 200,000. And that was the main earning, as opposed to that was the main earning. That was the main earning. Television. Te we got the last. Wow. Rivers Flow North was the last film, sort of, of that era. Wow, what a change! Because in fact, video stores built indie film in its early years. Wow. But that was the end of that era. And then Blockbuster. We, we don't need to go into the whole thing. But their scheme. Blockbuster was earning six billion. Was was bringing in six billion dollars a year and claiming no profit. And Viacom, which owned Blockbuster, was trying to sell it. Mm. And they couldn't because it was showing no profit. Mm. So by wiping out the model and the rest of the industry and, and all the video stores, and frankly, a lot of the independent distributors who couldn't sell videos for five bucks a piece, they managed to increase their, um, their gross by a billion dollars. So they went to seven billion dollars and reported a $75 million profit for the first time. Mm. And they still couldn't sell them. And so it failed. But they, they destroyed the model that had, had worked for independent film. So, Jay, tell us more about the semester, the semester program cinema. and yeah. how it works and yes. kids and Kevin's son, Keenan, uh, was part of it when we made Northern Borders. It was the, the first round at Middlebury. We, we sort of experimented with the idea on disappearances. We had a dozen Marlboro College kids. The idea is we bring together 27 professionals to ensure a professional level of production and then 40 students from 15 different colleges who take a semester off campus with us uh, where we have a week at Sundance Film Festival, seven weeks of classes, workshops, and pre-production, and six weeks of production. Now we're moving this, we're going to actually switch it a little, we're going to do seven weeks of production on this film because it is a bigger script. Um, and, you know, it's based on two ideas. One is a John Dewey concept of experiential learning, which talks about intensive learning that enlarges meaning through shared experience and joint action. And this is a perfect model for that. Because there are so many different jobs in making the film, there's so many different departments in making the film. And the other educational model is sort of Paulo Freire's concept of generating dialogue. So that the thing is really based on starting a dialogue on day one and getting everybody involved in it, talking about the story, talking about the script talking about the characters, talking about racial and gender representation, talking about, you know, locations, getting students deeply immersed in the narrative so that everything that they see happening, whether it's casting or locations or cinematography or costumes, becomes a metamorphosis because it changes. It's constantly changing. It's constantly metamorphosizing and growing. And so to keep that discussion going, so we... The classes include screenwriting and, and directing, where we, we six hours a week we talk about the script, talk about how we would approach scenes and directing the scenes. We also conduct casting out of that, and students lead the casting of it. Really? Um, yeah. Um, we then have a class in, in cinema studies where three times a week we're watching films that have either a thematic relation to what we're doing or a character relation to what we're doing. So we'll watch There Will Be Blood to look at the Daniel Day-Lewis character in relationship to Ethan Allen. Even though they're very different characters, they're, they're similar in some ways. They're over-the-top, big, self-motivated, you know, American drive characters. And expertly done by Daniel Day-Lewis. The one about the oil fields. Yeah, it's the so oil good. fields. Oh, it's so good. And so, so three times a week we're watching full-length movie, talk, 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 dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. And then we have a cultural studies class which is looking at the period, the history, the cultural stuff, religion, music, everything. We are going to reach out to Rhiannon Giddens for some of her slave-based um, songs that she's been developing. So we're, we're looking at trying to involve you know, musicians who specialize. The gal that's performing for us in o October, uh, Amethyst Kaya, is part of uh, Rhiannon Giddens' um, group, our native uh, sisters. That, that is focused on a lot of this stuff. So trying to pull in cultural stuff, so a cultural studies class will focus on that. We'll also have a class on racial equity and representation, dealing very specifically with 
considerations of race relative to